about to leave Already packing, come with me I'm not really asking We'll get away to a place where we don't know About to see the world in action What we can be, life with no distractions We'll get away, this is what we waited for Hello. Bottom right. I'm just looking at the line. Hello. Screen. We've got lots of students joining us. There is about a seven or eight second delay tonight, a bit longer than normal on, on YouTube. So we we'll, may have to allow a few extra seconds to see the live chat answers coming through, see how we get on with tonight's activities. That's not a problem if you're watching on catch up or replay, of course, because you can have as long as you like, as long as you pause the video and then maybe have a think about the questions and the answers before that either Alice, Brendan or Vicky take you through the suggested solutions. We've got lots to get through tonight, so uh, Vicky, I think you're going to just give us a quick overview and then we're cracking on with the first uh, the first activity. Excellent. Yeah, like, uh, like Jim said, it is our last re uh, resource management session. We did briefly touch on water two weeks ago, so we're going to look at it in a bit more detail today. We've got lots of different activities to um, help you consolidate the issues around water, um, particularly things like access to water, uh, water demand. We're going to look at water security, and we're also going to think about the ways that we can actually meet that demand for water. We're going to think about large-scale projects, and we're going to look at those appropriate technology, small-scale projects as well. So we you kick off quickly and we're going to start off with Alice for a 60 second challenge. Great, thank you Vicky. So you'll have 60 seconds to match the key phrases to definitions. Uh, you get, just to be clear, before I show it to you, you're going to need to match the letters on the left with the numbers on the right. Okay, so we're going to have 60 seconds. As I say, look on the left, we've got the key terms. 
on the right we've got the definitions and of course if you're watching on catch up you've got a bit longer but jim can we start the clock Okay, so eight definitions there to match up to key terms. Really quite an ask, I think, possibly in 60 seconds. So I'm sure we'll get some answers coming through in the chat in a moment. But Jim, can we have the big reveal? And I'll go through those. Thank you very much. Okay, so if you were scribbling down the letters and the numbers, I'll just run through those so you can tick them off. We've got A5, B8. C3, D6, E2, F1, G4, and H7. Now let's have a look at them. So water insecurity is really what this topic is all about. So we're moving beyond looking at uh, water issues in the UK and we're thinking about global water issues and water insecurity is a situation where a country or a community is living uh, without uh, the available water to ensure the population of an area enjoys good health, livelihood and earnings. Now, water stress, that might be to do with perhaps more to do with a, a period of time when the demand for water exceeds the available amount during a certain period or when the poor quality of water restricts its use. So thinking about when water is polluted and people can not drink it. Um, over abstraction. So abstraction is taking water out of something. And this is about when uh, water perhaps is being removed from an aquifer underground and it's being used more quickly than that aquifer is being recharged or the water is being replaced. So an aquifer being an underground layer of saturated permeable rock. And here in the Chilterns, the water bearing rock under my feet uh, is chalk. So waterborne diseases, we've got examples here of cholera and typhoid, both bacterial infections that are transmitted in contaminated water. Irrigation, I bet you knew that one, applying water to the land for farming. Uh, water surplus, so some areas are an area of water surplus rather than deficit, which means that water surplus is greater than the demand. So thinking about the UK, we might be thinking about somewhere like North Wales, where water is transferred on elsewhere. And then desalinisation is the process of removing salts and minerals from seawater. And I believe that Brendan's going to be telling us quite a bit more about that later on. OK, so I'm handing on because we've got a 30 second challenge. Perfect. Thank you very much, Alice. So we are looking, um, we've got a 30 second challenge. We have got uh, four different questions for the 30 second challenge, looking at some of the issues around water consumption increase. And we're looking at our main sources of water and we're going to think about water availability as well. So our first question is, why is water consumption increasing? Jim, can we have 30 seconds on the clock, please? So think about those reasons that make water, our consumption of water increase. Pop your answers into the chat window. Obviously, if you need a little bit more time when if you're watching um, on a delay, then you can pause the video and give yourself a little bit more time. Okay. Super, thank you very much. Some good answers coming through in the chat window at the moment. Jim, can we have the answers on the screen, please? Excellent. So we've got the idea of population growth, particularly that causes a rise in domestic use. So that that um, 
that use of water we have at home. We've got the idea of economic development as well. So once your country starts to economically develop, you're going to have a growth of commercial agriculture. So linking to irrigation that we've just talked about, this is the largest consumer of water for many countries thirsty industries that use huge amounts of water to make stuff so for example soft drinks but also plastic clothing all sorts of things there and we're gonna have a rise in living standards so actually people want those flush toilets they want showers all those other domestic appliances that we start buying once we uh when we want to increase our living standards excellent well done there so can we have the next question on the screen please jim so our next question is, what are our main sources of water? So 30 seconds on the clock starts now, hopefully. So think about where we get our water from. So 30 seconds up. Again, we've got some good answers coming through in the chat window. So, Jim, can we have the answers on the screen, please, so we can go through those? Super. So we have rivers and lakes, which can be transported if needed. So you might have um, an area where, where there's a water surplus. We've just talked about that, where um, you will then transport water using pipelines to an area where there is a deficit of water. We're going to look at this a little bit later in the session. And we've got aquifers, which are natural underground stores where water collects in porous rocks and the water is extracted by drilling wells or boreholes down into the rock, uh, especially in southeast England, we see these. And then we have reservoirs, those artificial lakes usually created by building a dam across a valley and allowing it to flood. Again, these create all sorts of issues that we're going to have a look at a little bit later. OK, question three, please, Jim. So what physical factors affect water availability? So if we can have 30 seconds up on the clock. Again, pop your answers into the chat window. Well done. We've got some good answers coming through again. We've uh, people are referencing geology in the chat window. Well done. So, Jim, can we have the answers on the screen, please? Excellent. So firstly, we've got climate. So areas where there is uh, most available water tend to be those tropical or temperate uh, climates. So obviously quite humid as well. Most mountainous areas also receive large amounts of precipitation through relief rainfall. Obviously, we know that there are certain areas which do not receive much uh, rainfall at all. And we've looked at those in previous sessions, particularly hot deserts um, and geology, which has come through in the chat window. So it's really important in terms of creating aquifers or groundwater doors super and again you know when you think about our country being uh you know we always moan that it's far too rainy here and actually it is very very wet at the moment may is particularly miserable so we have lots of water availability in the country here right last question please jim so how do people affect water availability we've just looked at how um the physical environment affects water availability how do people affect water availability so can we have 30 seconds on the clock please So think about the things that we do as humans, which will have an impact on the level of water that is available to us. Okay, thank you. Again, some good answers coming through. So we've got the idea of pollution coming up in the chat window. We've got people just talking about poverty. So Jim, can we have the um, answers on the screen, please? Okay, 
So we have pollution coming through. So water supplies that become unfit for human use, there's less safe water available. So that might be because uh, chemicals have been dumped through industrial processes, meaning obviously there's less, there's less water for people to actually use. We've got the idea of over abstraction when we have pumped far too much water up from rivers and lakes, normally for irrigation. Um, and obviously that takes place at a faster rate than can actually be replenished by rainfall. Um, some really famous examples, the um, Aral Sea, for example, or uh, Lake Chad in Africa, both shrunk massively because of over abstraction. But limited infrastructure for collection and delivery, you might have water being wasted, like link, um, leaky pipes, for example. But you also might not have pipelines reaching those areas where they're needed, particularly in low income countries. And then finally, we've got the idea of poverty. So you've got rivers, standpipes, wells, all those sort of things that, that we are in low income countries, the other options are often too expensive, those water transfer schemes. So bottled water may only be a safe, maybe an only a safe source of some people, but obviously it's really unaffordable for some. Hand over to uh, Brendan now for a categorised activity. Many thanks, Vicky. Now, some of the ideas that uh, Vicky was discussing there will actually come into this. So what we're looking at uh, in this particular activity is water insecurity. So it's important that you understand what that means. Essentially, it's, it's any place that is concerned about perhaps not having enough water. And if that's the case and they move to a situation where they become water insecure, there are going to be consequences. There are going to be impacts. So what we have shown here are a variety of those possible impacts numbered one through to eight. And your task is to categorize them according to whether they would be social and political impacts or economic impacts or environmental impacts. So have a think about those. What you might want to write down if, you're, if you've got a pen and paper with you is just what I do with my students is perhaps to abbreviate. You just put SOC for social and political, SOC, EC for economic, EC, and N for environmental, ENV. So SOC, EC. Env, and then just sort the numbers according to which column you think they should be in. Over to you, you have 60 seconds. Well done. Now let's have a look at the categories as they should be. And if we look at the three categories, I'm just going to go through each one just to clarify. I'm going to start with the economic impact in the middle because that's probably the easiest and most straightforward category to think of because it's usually to do with things like money and jobs. And indeed, number one is to do with you know productivity. So is that going to be reduced by having water insecurity? Is the you know, amount of GDP going to go down, uh, for example? And then there's going to be rising costs as well, which is clearly an economic factor. If we then look at the third column, environmental impact of water insecurity, that's going to be always connected with things like ecosystems, wildlife, perhaps the built environment. In this case, we have pollution because that's going to affect the environment. Sometimes if you have less water in rivers, for example, it means the pollution is more concentrated. There's less chance of pollution being washed away and over abstraction uh, from the water table, especially if you're getting water from aquifers and so on, can be very problematic for wildlife as well. So we go back to the first column, the social and political impacts. I've left that to last because uh, in my experience, that's the hardest one to find and to think of. So social and political impacts, we've got here waterborne diseases. So it often concerns things to do with health. It often concerns things to do with water supply as well, actually, and there's because that's linked to health. So we see number five, 
safe drinking water sh uh, shortage. The third and the number three and seven go into these categories because they're clearly political. So you could get uh, tensions between groups or conflict between different stakeholders. And the other things that could go into that category would be anything concerning housing or culture or education. They all fit into that very large, rather amorphous category. So make sure you've revised those three categories. They do reappear uh, time and time again at A-level as well. So if you're moving forward to, with geography to A-level, do try and remember those three categories. Right. Uh, back to Vicky, I think. I think oh, it's, it's me. Alice, <laughs> it's Alice. Yeah. Back to Alice. Uh, my apologies. It's all right. It's all right. Right. So what we're going to think about now is perhaps drilling down a little bit into what we've been talking about. And first of all, I want you to think about jotting down uh, in the chat or on your bit of paper uh, three impacts of water insecurity on food production. And do we have a timer for this one, Jim? So food production, farmers, three impacts. Okay, thank you. Right, so just if you're on catch up and you want a bit longer, obviously you can pause the video and finish what you were writing. Uh, but this is in a way getting you to think about how to develop your answer. So if you're talking about how water insecurity has an impact on food production, and it's a two mark question, how are you gonna get the second mark? How are you gonna get the second and third marks? Cause you need to um, go into a bit more depth. So let's have a look at what we've got as possible answers. So impacts on farmers, we've got increased need for irrigation. So clearly if there is less rainfall in a particular season and an area is affected by a drought, there's gonna be increased need for irrigation of the crops to ensure a good harvest. Um, that could add cost uh, to the farmers um, and we've seen it, it also has environmental impacts as well. If that irrigation water isn't available or they don't have the technology, clearly farmers are going to experience lower crop yields and that's going to affect their profits. Um, and we're not just thinking about um, crops uh, that uh, you or I would um, buy to eat. We might also be thinking about something like uh, cotton as well. But in terms of food crops, we've got things like wheat is a very, very water hungry crop. And so is alfalfa, which is actually what is fed to cows. And clearly livestock quality is going to decrease as well in a situation of drought. OK, so that's water and food production. But the next question is linked to production, but a different type of production. OK, so beyond primary industries, if we think about secondary industries and manufacturing industries, can you give me three impacts of water insecurity on industrial output, please? OK, let's start the timer. OK, so just about time to put your pens down and let's have a look at the answers that we've got. Compare it to what you've got. Three ideas about the impact of water insecurity on manufacturing industries. So clearly in a in a uh, situation of shortage, we've got the cost of water increases and that's going to affect the profits every company is making. The Often they will pass um, increasing costs on to the consumer so that customers will face higher prices for their product. 
rates, that's a problem, problem for the industry and it's a problem for us. Thirsty manufacturing industries affected, for example, might be the textiles ind industry or iron and steel industry, uh, specifically also the car industry. And I think uh, Vicky mentioned beverage industry. Um, clearly, production has to stall if there's insufficient water for the factory to run. So again, that's going to have a knock on effect on um, profits and how much money a company has to pay its employees. And then uh, lastly here, we've got less energy production. So it's easy to forget that um, energy generation is often dependent on the on water availability to some extent. Now, hydroelectric power is an obvious one, uh, but also remember that water is used for cooling in coal, gas, and nuclear power stations. And if there's insufficient water to support uh, energy production, that's gonna feed into lots of different industries. It's gonna have lots of knock on across the board into industrial production. So hopefully you can see how just saying water insecurity affects factories. Actually, that's the starting point. And you can go beyond that and talk about um, some examples to develop your point. OK, I'm going to hand over to Vicky here for the connection wall. OK, thank you, Alice. So we're going to have a look now at some ways to try and make our water use a little bit more sustainable. So um, in the interest of time today, rather than getting you to try and guess what connects them, I'm going to tell you uh, the three categories. I'm going to go one at a time and get you to try and tell me which four phrases go with the, each category. So the first category we're going to have to think about is the idea of recycled and reclaimed water. So there are four um, four phrases on the on the screen which are to do with recycled and claim reclaimed water. A recycled and reclaimed water is basically sewage to remove any solids or impurities. So have a think about which of those might be to do with recycled and reclaimed water. So again, have a um, pop your answers into the chat window. If you are watching on catch up, obviously you can give yourself a little bit more time. So I'm going to give you a few moments to have a think about those ones that go recycled and reclaimed water. Um, give you a few moments just to get some answers into the chat window. And again, if you're uh, watching on replay, you can obviously give yourself a little bit more time by pressing pause. OK, so again, we're looking for answers that go recycled and reclaimed water, that sewage water that has been treated to remove solids and impurities. So what do you think might be going with those? OK, there's a couple of answers already coming through. That's really good. Uh, Jim, can we have the first uh, selection on the screen, please? Excellent. So firstly, it's being we're talking about reusing treated domestic or industrial wastewater. OK, that's what we're recycling in the first place. Um, it's often used in cooling, for steel making and energy production. So we just talked about the fact that water is used as a cooling agent in those big industrial processes. It can be used in fish farming and agriculture. OK, so the idea, again, agriculture and irrigation. And we can talk about like sewage being pumped into lagoons to help algae grow and oxygenate water, which helps with photosynthesis. Well, that's how it's linked to that use in fish farming. So again, if you need to pause for a bit longer to have a look at those, then please do. But we've got some really good answers coming through. And it is a really tricky one to start off with. OK, so second one we're looking that we can save water is by using grey water, which is water from domestic use. So it's water that we've used inside our homes. So have a think about the things that might go with that grey water. So what could we possibly use it for? What might be some of the issues with it? Where we where might we get that grey water from? So again, I'm going to give you a few moments. Hopefully we we'll get some answers through the chat window. So think about the ones that are to do with this grey water. It's from that domestic use. We're looking at possible issues, possible uses for this grey water. And where might it come from in the first place? OK. So again, we've got a couple of answers coming through. Well done. Jim, can we have the answers on the screen, please? Obviously, if you're watching on catch up, you can pause very quickly. This water is taken from sinks, baths, showers and washing machines. So it's that water that you've already used. Many people have some sort of pipe system that takes it through to a water pipe into the garden. Um, 
If used within 24 hours, it provides valuable fertilizers for plants. Because there's quite a lot of chemicals in there. But it, one of the issues with it is it may contain traces of dirt, food, grease, hair and cleaning products. So actually, although it's very good in terms of um, saving water, it does smell a little bit unpleasant. So if you've got a water butt full of grey water in your garden on a hot day, it's not going to be very good. And you can use it for irrigation and you can use it for watering your plants. So it does, like we said, it, if used within 24 hours, it does provide valuable fertiliser for plants. But if you leave it too long in the storage tank, the bacteria rises and the water quality declines. So we talked about it being a bit smelly. It's it's a to recycle water, but it is quite a small scale, obviously using it for irrigation. We're not talking about large scale irrigation projects. We're talking about sort of watering the plants in your garden, really. OK, so we have got four that are left um, on the screen in white. What do we think connects these four remaining uh, phrases? So we've got turning off the tap when brushing your teeth, only using washing machines and dishwashers for a full load, installing low flow shower heads and installing a twin flush toilet system. What do we think might connect these four leftover phrases? I'm going to give you a couple of moments. Okay, we've already got some answers coming through. You are correct. Some good answers coming through the chat window. How we can save water at home. Well done. Well done, Chris. That's a really good answer. So, Jim, can we just have that? They're perfect. So, we've got the idea of obviously turning a tap off and brushing teeth. Hopefully, we will do that. Um, using Only making sure that we're using those appliances when they are full, so not wasting water on half loads. Installing low flow shower heads so we're not using huge amounts of water in the shower. And dual flushes. So, you only use a lot of water when you are needed. Well done. Um, we've also got a few others that you can have that. So for example, you might want to water gardens just late at night or early in the morning to reduce that evaporation or collecting rainwater in the garden, all sorts of things that we can use to save water at home. So I am now going to hand over to Brendan for a scrambled sentence activity. Many thanks, Vicky. So we're now looking at an activity which concerns desalinization. So make sure you know what desalinization is. Essentially, it's the removal of salt and a few other minerals from seawater so that you can produce fresh water, which is drinkable so that human beings can consume it. Sometimes it's called potable water or potable water. You can also use it for irrigation because salt water doesn't go down too well with plants. So how does it happen? What's the process? Well, there are two main processes. One's thermal which you may have done in science where you're boiling water and the water evaporates and you can condense it somewhere else. And the water you condense somewhere else has the salt removed from it. And there's another method called the membrane method. And, and that's actually the most common method now. 69% of water in the world is desalinated that way. So when you remove the salt, there are a few issues. Uh, it leaves behind the salt quite often as brine, toxic brine, which is very, very concentrated salty water. And sometimes there's a toxicity about it because chemicals are used in the process and that can be left in that brine. So what are you going to do with that? Uh, so sometimes that's um, just tipped into the sea, uh, hopefully a long way away from the shore because it can actually damage the sea floor. But even then, it can be an issue because the chemicals in the toxic brine can be an issue getting to the food chain. It can use a lot of energy. Uh, it's very costly to move the water once you've uh, removed the, the salt from it, especially if you're trying to move it inland in a perhaps a, one of the Middle Eastern countries where there are quite big cities inland. Uh, technology is improving. And um, it's not, you know, there are some hopeful signs that perhaps you can combine it with low carbon technology, such as solar powered desalinization. So your task is to sort the steps for the process of desalinization. I'm going to let you read them for yourselves. You have to rearrange the numbers into the correct order. So if you're jotting this down, there's, there's just six numbers. You have to rearrange them into the correct order. So we're now going to give you some moments to do that. Off you go. So this process, six items, if you were to put these into a paragraph, 
what would be the correct order using the numbers for these statements. There is an important key term in number two, which you've probably noticed. Number two, it says reverse osmosis. That's sort of the crux of what uh, the membrane method of desalinization is. And we have another key term further down, remineralization. We'll talk about that in a moment. Okay. So try and get your answers sorted into the correct a sequence of statements and Jim should we have a look at the correct pattern so here we go the first step is the seawater intake usually from the ocean and a protective grill means that marine life in theory can't swim into the structure because that would be problematic for the the uh, sea life but also for the uh, the, the machinery the second point, would correct point, would be infiltration. The pretreatment filters out solids such as sand and sediment, small particles that may have got in. Then we have this key process, uh, which is the third thing, in reverse osmosis. This is the, 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 the way that uh, the membrane method works, where the filtered seawater is pushed through very fine membranes under very high pressure. The idea is to allow the fresh water to pass through leaving the, the brine, the concentrated brine, the salts behind. Then once we've got the water, we come to the next process of remineralization. And this is actually when the desalinated water has minerals added to meet uh, various requirements and regulations. And presumably to give it a, a, a taste, water actually does have taste. It's different to pure distilled water. The penultimate statement is storage. Drinking water is stored was distributed and then we have uh, the whole process of expensive you know transfer of water and the final point would be the water outlet where the concentrated seawater the brine is returned to the ocean through diffusers to be diluted hopefully by ocean currents well done everybody okay back to vicky super thank you brendan Okay, so we have a case study alert here. For this um, for this unit, you have to know a case study of a large-scale water transfer scheme. So the one on the screen is Lesotho Highlands Water Project, which lots of you will have studied. So it's a large-scale transfer scheme between Lesotho, which is a country with a huge water surplus, nice mountainous area, high levels of rainfall and quite a low population. And they transfer lots of their water to South Africa, a country with far less rainfall, bigger population and a water deficit. And actually, you might remember a couple of years ago that uh, South Africa reached um, day zero when they were almost running out of water in Cape Town. So you may have studied this one. Um, some of you actually will have looked at China's South North Water Transfer Project instead. So you need to know some of the, you just need to know some sort of key facts and figures for both, um, sorry, not both, whichever case of the you have studied. What we're going to have a look at in our next activity, it's an on-balance activity, we're going to have a look at some of the disadvantages and advantages of large water transfer schemes. So they're not specifically about the two that we have just mentioned, but they would be relevant to both of them. Okay, so our first First question on the, scale, on the screen for you is what are the advantages of large scale water transfer schemes? So maybe think sort of economically, think socially, what are those countries, how are those countries benefiting from these big large scale water transfer schemes, often involving huge amounts of pipelines, you've got dams and all sorts, very normally quite expensive as well. So I'm going to give you a couple of moments just to get some ideas down into the chat window. Again, obviously, if you're watching on catch up, you can get some ideas down, but you can pause the video if you need a little bit longer. So think about some of the pros of these large scale water transfer schemes. There are obviously lots of them because they do cost lots of money and we still build them anyway. Um, what do we think the uh, good points of these schemes are? Okay, I'm just going to give you a couple more moments. Excellent. So we've got some good answers coming through here about like the idea of even, evening out uh, water distribution. Well done, Chris. That's a good answer. What else do we think? you just another moment to get your answers into the chat window okay Jim can we have some advantages popped onto the scales please 
super. So we will have an increase in GDP, particularly for those low income countries, which they can then spend on development. That's going to increase the uh, standard of living for the people in their country. So, for example, the uh, Lesotho Highlands Water Project actually provides Lesotho with over 75 percent of its income, which is really important for developing that country. It does also supply countries with um, hydroelectric power, which again fuels economic development, and that means that there's plenty of um, in a sort of plenty of energy to help enable industrial growth. But we've also got things like it increases our access to a safe and reliable water supply, which lots of these countries won't have. It also increases the level of sanitation in those countries. Obviously, that has an impact on overall health and disease. But it in, we've got additionally the improvements to transport infrastructure as access roads have to be constructed to uh, make their way to these big projects which then obviously has a long-term benefit that the rest of the country can use well done lots of good answers coming through there some really good ideas about that whole balancing out the supply and demand over large areas okay so these projects are pretty controversial though um what do we think the disadvantages of these large-scale water transfer schemes might be so we've talked we've mentioned a couple of these already what might be the arguments and the drawbacks of these large scale uh, water transfer schemes? So just going to give you a couple of moments to get some ideas in the chat window. Again, on catch up, you can obviously pause the video and give yourself a little bit more time. What do we think? Think about some of the, like you, you may have studied a particular dam. So think, think about some of the issues around there. Okay, again, some good answers coming through. We've got the idea that they are really expensive. Obviously, we mentioned that a moment ago. The idea of displacing people, well done. Can we have the answers on the screen, please, Jim? Excellent. We've also got the idea of flooding coming through on the chat window as well. Well done, Erica. So they are really expensive. So in order to build them, LICs often have to take out huge loans to fund them, which means that they get caught up with lots of long term debt, which again means in the future they've got less money to spend on developmental projects. Um, we've got displacement of people to build dams. So if you, if you build a dam, then the area behind it floods, which means that um, people have to move out. In order to build the first phase of the Lesotho's Highland Water Project, over 30,000 people had to be moved. We've also got some other issues. So we've got things like destruction to wetland ecosystems downstream because you've got less water. You've also got disruption upstream because you've got more water. You've obviously got changes in the water temperature, which lots of animals and other species cannot cope with. It does stop fish migrating, which affects food supplies a bit further down the river, obviously livelihoods as well. You get lots of water being lost through leakage. Up to 40% of all water in these water transfer schemes gets lost through leaky pipes. And also, in order to pay for them, quite often you get increased water tariffs for the poorest people who have to pay for the schemes, and they don't tend to benefit from them as much as they've been promised. So there's lots of, sort of pros and cons around these. So we're going to hand over to Alice for the last activity that is going to look at a Oh, <laughs> it's a noisy siren again to remind us that we have a second case study with this water optional topic. So you will need to know a local scale uh, sustainable water scheme case study. Now you might have studied uh, Wakel Basin River Project, which is based in Rajasthan in India. However, you might not have studied that one. So don't worry if you haven't. You might have studied um, something called uh, the Hitosa a local scheme in Ethiopia, uh, which was linked to the activities of water aid. So the chances are you've looked at one of those two. Um, and what we're going to look at now is just thinking about some key terms that you would want to get into your answer when you're in particular discussing how those projects are more sustainable and particularly beneficial to the local people that have um, benefited from that, that aid scheme you've looked at. Okay, so Jim, if we can have a look at the first one. Now, I'm wondering if I take Brendan's tack here and don't read them out because it would give it away. <laughs> so we've got missing vowels here. And this is the word that we'd be using to discuss either the Hitosa water supply scheme in Ethiopia or the Wakel Basin River project in Rajasthan in India. So what do you think uh, if we slotted the vowels back in, that might spell out. Okay, Jim, let's have a look. 
And yes, well done to people in the chat who guessed it. It is small scale. So when we say small scale, we're still talking about, for example, uh, thousands of people, uh, but we're not talking about millions of people perhaps benefiting from the scheme like the, uh, the large scale schemes that, that Vicky was talking about. So thousands of people may well uh, benefit, but it's, it's based around uh, communities um, and it's based around uh, a, a few settlements rather than perhaps a whole region of a country. Right, let's have a look at the next key term we want to get into our answer. So again, the vowels are missing. There are two words. What might that be spelling out? That would link directly to talking about a sustainable water scheme, perhaps in a low income country. OK, and I know we've got a bit of a lag. So I'll just give you a couple more seconds. OK, Jim, let's have a look at the answer. So the answer, of course, is appropriate technology. Now, what do we mean by appropriate technology? It's technology um, that's suited to the needs, the skills, um, and perhaps the wealth of locals that are benefiting from this technology. Um, in, we, in the uh, instance of Hitosa in Ethiopia, we're looking at a gravity-fed scheme drawing on uh, water from springs high up in the mountains that is being uh, channeled or funneled down to um, local residents much further down the mountainside. Um, in the instance of the Wakel Basin River Project, we're looking at um, small-scale dams and embankments that are potentially being built by hand. Um, so we're thinking about uh, technology that a community can be involved in and makes maintenance much, much easier. It would be inappropriate to uh, give people who a community that don't have very much money to maintain a scheme, for example, a desalination plant. They wouldn't have the money uh, to maintain it or to pay for all the energy that that sort of uh, approach to water treatment um, can have. OK, let's have a look at the next key term. OK, so missing vowels again. I'll give you a few seconds to have a look at it. What do you want to be able to talk about with this case study? And I can see people are having some good ideas in the chat. Well done for having a go, even if you can see what one of the words means. Oh, and well done. Two correct answers, and of course, this is spelling out community management. And as I say, if you can do something on a local scale with appropriate technology, then uh, you're more likely to involve the community directly. And of course, community management of a scheme will lead to greater involvement. OK, let's have a look at the next. Oh, it's three words this time. It's our penultimate missing vowels activity. What do people think? Another couple of seconds. OK, and well done to those people who've had a go. There's quite a lot to type here, but the answer is local decision making. So local decision making goes back to what we're saying about community involvement. This is less of a, a, a top down scheme. It's a scheme that's going to involve local people to create it, to construct the infrastructure, the technology. But also it's going to involve uh, locals making decisions about where they want uh, the water pump and, and, and various pieces of infrastructure to go. Because, because the charities are very clear that they want the community to be involved from the start and it to be designed to benefit them. And let's have the last term we want to get into our answer then. Thinking about jargon, this again is the third, this is a three word puzzler. I can see there's really some very good people in the chat today. Well done to you. And of course, the answer is, you can go for the acronym if you like, it's non-governmental organisation or NGO. And these are the international charities, uh, for example, 
like Water Aid, uh, like Red Cross, I think the Ethiopian Red Cross was also involved in the Hitosa scheme, um, that are on the ground and that are helping these uh, community managed schemes to work and, and ensure that perhaps international aid money that's been donated for this purpose actually goes to the people uh, for whom it was intended. Brilliant. Okay, so that's that case study. Wow. Superb stuff. Thanks, Alice and Vicky and Brendan. Uh, that was great, wasn't it? And some uh, very strong answers in the chat. What did you think? Really yeah, good. Take yeah, we, from great Erica job, and Chris. We're good. Yeah, really Consistent good. Answers. Yeah, well, quick well, and accurate answers. Yeah. And as Vicky okay. mentioned, and, and Alice and Brendan as well, of course, lots and lots of people watch these sessions on catch up or replay, so you get the chance to. Uh, Give yourself a bit more time because that was under a lot of time pressure, the live student audience there. And uh, as we mentioned right at the start, this is the third of uh, three sessions specifically on resource management. So well worth uh, going to tutor2.net forward slash live, selecting the GCSE geography filter on the replay section and you'll be able to pick up uh, the PowerPoints and the, the video replays of all the previous sessions. In fact, the whole GCSE geography yeah. series that we've run so far. Many, many thanks. We're going to have to uh, leave it there on our live session. So a huge thanks as always to, to Alice, Brendan and Vicky for putting these sessions together and delivering them. If you found it useful, give us a thumbs up. That always helps us uh, get these sessions found on YouTube. And we look forward. Good luck to everybody who's got assessments coming up. I saw in the chat a few people have got some assessments this week yeah. on this very topic. So absolutely all the best. I'm sure you'll be good. Uh, and of course, anyone watching on Catch Up and Replay as well, absolutely all the best for any assessments on this, this crucial topic. So from now, from all four of us, see you later. Yeah, goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.